Okay, everyone, this is a lecture on plasma membrane, um, not the full chapter, just um, maybe not even half of it, probably a third of the chapter. And so you're only responsible for what I cover here. Again, a reminder that you should have your review sheet out and should be taking notes on it. And so the reason why we're hitting these concepts is because they're going to be applicable, um, especially when we're talking about cell signaling. Okay. And a lot of what was what's in the rest of this chapter, we've already covered before. Okay. Um, so one of the things I want to focus on or sort of elaborate a little bit more on is ion channels. Okay. Um, and so even in bio 111 and um, in here, I guess a little bit in terms of in the beginning, of the semester, we talked about the plasma membrane, right? We talk about certain proteins that are in the plasma membrane, okay? And we have peripheral proteins, we have integral proteins. If we talk about um, different types of proteins, we can talk about receptor proteins, right? Ion or channel proteins, right? That basically transport specific molecules through. Obviously, um, ion channels are one type of channel protein, okay? And, and when we think about a channel protein, a lot of the channel proteins are ion channels, okay? Um, also, we talked about like carrier proteins, okay? Um, cell recognition proteins, right? So these are all different types of proteins that sit within the plasma membrane, okay? So again, what we're gonna focus on here are ion channels, okay? And now, these ion channels are important for the function of any cell type, um, they are well studied, obviously, in neurons, right, nerve cells, and also in muscle cells because the opening and closing of ion channels is responsible for generating an action potential and is responsible for the ability of these cells to transmit electrical signals, again, in the form of an action potential, okay? So, um, again, particularly important when you think of the function of nerve cells and muscle cells, okay? But again, ion channels are just as important in any cell type, okay? Okay, so it says transport through ion channels is extremely rapid. So more than a million ions per second can move through those ion channels. That's why it's possible, or that's what, yeah, it's possible that these are responsible for generating an action potential because they're, they're such rapid movement, which then causes a change in the membrane potential, okay? Um, Okay, so again, and I, I've probably mentioned this a million times before, when we talk about any type of channel protein, it's super specific, okay? So ion channels are selective or specific, meaning there is a specific channel to move chloride ions. There is a specific, there are specific sodium channels, specific potassium channels, specific calcium channels, okay? And so it says most of these have gates, and so they will only open in response to specific stimuli. So as, again, as you can, as you might imagine, I said, um, you know, the movement of, of certain ions like sodium and potassium is important for generating an action potential. Well, obviously, you don't want that to happen all the time, right? And so they're regulated. Okay. So this is basically showing you... Um, you know, what sort of a, an ion channel looks like. And we've probably, we've seen this before. And so we said most of them are gated, right? Meaning that if it's closed, those ions are not going to be able to move through, okay? And when we think about movement through, okay, in terms of, so say this was a sodium, these were sodium ions, this was a sodium channel. Once the gate opens, they're going to move through that channel based on their gradient, right? And so they're going to move along their concentration gradient, um, when we talk about the movement of ions, also a, an electrical gr gradient is gonna come into play. So we always talk about the, the membrane. It has a charge, right? There is a charge across the membrane. Um, and so I think I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that as, as we move through, but just sort of keep that in mind, okay? So <clears throat> there are ligand gated channels and there are voltage gated channels. Again, we're talking about ion channels, okay? And so again, we said they have a gate, meaning they're gonna only open in response to some sort of stimuli, okay? If, they, if it is a ligand gated channel, that means it will open in response to binding of something like a neurotransmitter to it, okay? So when a neurotransmitter binds, it will cause that channel to open, and then that may generate or cause the generation of an action potential, but essentially you can think of it 
as stimulating that, that cell that that neurotransmitter binds to, okay? Now, it's not always stimulatory, um, and you can take neurobiology if you want to learn all about that. Okay, there are also voltage-gated channels, and these channels will open in response to changes in electric potential across the plasma membrane, okay? So we should know the difference. Ligand-gated channels will open in response to a binding of a neurotransmitter to it. Voltage-gated channels will open when the membrane potential changes, okay? One second. Okay, so continuing on with this. So this is going to just be a little summary of kind of um, learning about the ion channels or, or talking a little bit more about those ion channels. So in terms of the role of ion channels in transmitting electrical impulses or really learning about the action potential, um, those experiments were done actually in giant squid axons. Okay, so there were a particular two scientists, Hodgkin and Huxley, um, 1952, basically published a series of, of experiments using the giant squid axon. And really, um, that was really when we started to understand the role of ion channels in, in the generation of electrical impulses, okay? Um, and so they basically can put electrodes in the axon and they could mem measure changes in membrane potential um, when certain channels were opened or closed. And so basically they could measure the change in membrane potential if they opened a potassium channel or a sodium channel. And so by doing that, they were able to really figure out the function of these ion channels and the role they played in generating an action potential, right? Again, sending information long distances um, throughout the nervous system. Okay, now, um, so, and so we're gonna talk, we're gonna, this is sort of setting up to talk a little bit more about that, okay? So it says here, I, so these channels that we're talking about, I just said they move, you know, ions move along their concentration gradient, okay? Those are not pumps, those are ion channels. Um, however, there are ion pumps, right? And when we say something's a pump, that, that sort of suggests that there's energy put in right from atp so we think about that sodium potassium pump right that sodium potassium pump sits in every membrane every cell membrane and basically pumps sodium and potassium against their concentration gradient in order to maintain a certain plasma membrane potential okay um and so that's what this is talking to you about and so it says the ionic composition of the cytoplasm is different than that of the extracellular fluids. And again, because that's set up like that, meaning that you have a different concentration of sodium outside the cell versus inside the cell, right? And, and same thing for potassium, that's gonna dictate or basically allow those um, ions to move along their concentration gradient when these channels are opened, okay? So when you think about the sodium potassium pump, that is there to maintain just um, resting membrane potential and to maintain the specific, specific concentration gradients of sodium potassium, okay? When we think about those channels, right, the ligand gated and the voltage gated channels that we were talking about, um, these are opened in, a, in, in response to a stimuli, right? And once they are, as I said, the sodium and the potassium can move along their concentration gradient. And when they do that, that will change the charge across the membrane and change the membrane potential and then can generate an action potential, which is, a, which is the way um, neurons are able to transmit information, okay? So I'm trying to kind of put things into perspective. All right, so... If we look at these different concentrations, so I sort of alluded to this, but I didn't tell you kind of what the concentration of what the concentrations of sodium potassium were, but just to give you an idea, and nobody needs to memorize this, okay? But if you talk, if you look at concentration in millimolar, okay, and you look intracellular versus extracellular, okay, and this is showing you in a squid axon versus a mammalian cell, um, you can see the actual concentrations are different, but it's the same trend, right? So let's look at mammalian cells. So potassium intracellular concentration of potassium is 140 millimolar extracellular is 5 millimolar sodium 
five, about five millimolar intracellular, extracellular, 145. Okay, chloride, you can see for intracellular, 110 extracellular. Okay, now, again, we're when you talk about action potential and transmission of nerve impulses, what you're primarily going to be talking about are potassium and sodium. Okay, and so if you look at these, you can see there's this sort of steep gradient that's set up, meaning there's a high concentration of potassium inside the cell and a really low concentration outside. So think for a second, what will happen if we open a potassium channel? Which way is it going to move? It's gonna move from inside the cell to outside the cell, okay? And a whole bunch of positive ions will be moving outside the cell, all right? So again, the sodium potassium pump maintains these gradients, okay? Again, the ligand-gated and voltage-gated ion channels that we that I sort of introduced don't have anything to do with maintaining resting membrane potential or maintaining these gradients, okay? But they do have a whole bunch to do with generating an action potential. All right. Okay, so I already said this too. It says, because ions are electrically charged, pumping results in electric gradients across the plasma membrane. So I just showed you the sort of concentration gradient that's set up, but again, these are charged molecules. So that's gonna also affect the electric potential of the membrane, okay? So here's now talking a little bit more about the electric potential. So resting membrane potential, or in resting squid axon particularly, resting membrane potential will vary depending on cell type, okay? It says the resting memory potential is 60 milli, it's minus 60 millivolts. When you talk about resting or when you talk about membrane potential, you always talk about the inside of the cell versus the outside. So if the inside of the cell is negative, it's minus 60 millivolts. So we would say the resting membrane potential of a squid axon is about minus 60 millivolts. When you think about a neuron, a human neuron or whatever, resting membrane potential is about minus 70 millivolts, okay? All right, so here's a whole bunch of kind of what we've just been talking about in, in picture form here. Um, I told you that the sodium potassium pump for which I introduced this probably sort of quickly, but we definitely introduced it in, um, bio 111 right or general bio one you should have heard about this before maybe even in anatomy and physiology one you might have heard of this um but this sodium potassium pump is what is responsible for maintaining these concentration gradients of sodium and potassium okay it's also because these are charged molecules responsible for maintaining this resting membrane potential of minus 60 millivolts okay now, what this is showing you here, um, also um, showing you sort of then movement of potassium through the channel, meaning if you look here, you got a lot of um, a lot of potassium right inside the cell versus not a lot outside. So it's going to have the tendency to move that way. OK, um, what this is, these are this is showing you a uh, I, I don't even know if I really want to mention it, but. <laughs> There are also leakage channels, potassium and sodium channels that are just open. And so they just allow the flow of ions to move through. Okay, remember that, you know, when you think about diffusion and the movement of molecules, they're never static, right? They're always moving sort of um, along their, their gradients. Okay, and so that's what this is showing you here. And that potassium is really um, the, the main player in maintaining membrane potential or resting membrane potential. Okay, so you might want to just forget I said that. <laughs> just focus on the sodium potassium pump here. Um, but I, because I, I didn't really talk about leakage channels yet, and I don't know why my computer does that. I apologize. Um, okay, but that's what that's what this is saying. So when we're talking about resting membrane potential, sodium potassium pump, also these potassium channels that are that are open. Okay. Um, those two things contribute the most to resting membrane potential, okay? So again, this is not a ligand-gated channel or a voltage-gated channel. This is a different type of potassium channel that is open pretty much all the time that allows potassium to flow through, okay? So it is these two things, the sodium-potassium pump, 
and these leakage potassium channels or these channels that are always open that basically maintain this membrane potential at minus 60 millivolts, okay? Super important. If there is a problem with one of these and this membrane potential is not at minus 60 millivolts, it's going to make it, um, I mean, it'll either make it really easy to generate an action potential, which is going to be a problem. It also can make it super, super difficult to generate an action potential, which would, be, which would be a problem. Bottom line is, if the resting membrane potential is not maintained where it should be at minus 60 millivolts, then cells that conduct nerve impulses, right, or that generate action potentials like muscle cells and nerve cells, right, neurons, are going to be severely affected, okay? So again, you can see based on this too, well, you know, you talk about, um, you know, electrolyte levels in the blood, right? Well, if those are off, see what it's going to throw off? It's going to throw off this whole process here, going to, again, affect generation of action potentials, okay? And so if your neurons or your nerve cells cannot function properly, your muscle cells can't function properly, you're going to have a big problem. And so it is um, life-threatening to have a, a severe imbalance of potassium or sodium, okay? So you can, you, you know, sometimes you think about, or sometimes it's sort of hard to connect these concepts, but um, the reason why it's life-threatening to have, um, you know, uh, those concentrations of sodium potassium to be off, why that's life-threatening is because of this, right? What's happening at the cell membrane, okay? All right, so we just said this. So again, that was talking about resting membrane potential, okay? Now, we can talk about action potentials. I've been kind of talking about it this whole time. We wanna think about, and again, we get into this way more in neurobiology, but you wanna think about an action potential right, a nerve impulse and action potential as something that's going to be generated when a cell is activated, okay, when it's transmitting information down that long axon. So when you're talking about, oh, I want to move my foot, that thought, right, that information being transmitted down the spinal cord and then essentially out to um, a muscle in your foot, right? That action potential travels all the way down that axon, say, think about from the spinal cord down to the foot, okay? What happens molecular, molecular, molecularly or cellularly, because that's what course we're in, right? During an action potential is what we're going to talk about, right? So that membrane potential, remember we said resting membrane potential in the squid axon was about minus 60 millivolts. Well, in an action potential, that that membrane potential goes from minus 60, minus 60 millivolts to about plus 30 millivolts in less than a millisecond. And again, all due to the movement of sodium and potassium, okay? And so that's what this is saying here. Results from rapid sequential opening and closing of voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. So if I ask you what ions are responsible for generating an action potential, and I gave you the choice of sodium, potassium, calcium, and chloride, right? The answer is sodium and potassium, okay? Sodium and potassium. All right, and so what this is showing you is actually a member, an action potential, okay? Graph, graphically, so you start off at minus 60 millivolts. This is membrane potential, right? This is time, and basically you go up to about plus 30 and come back down, okay? Back down to resting. This is the action potential. All right, so now what this is showing you, well, what's actually happening with those channels, okay, during that action potential, okay? So at resting, remember, any of these gated channels are closed, okay? This potassium channel is not the same as this. This is a different, this is a leakage channel, okay? All right, so these voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels are closed at resting, okay? The sodium potassium pump is working. Those leakage potassium channels are open during resting, okay? That's what's gonna maintain that minus 60 millivolts. All right, but those two things are not involved in generating the action potential. So what we're gonna talk about are these voltage-gated channels here. All right, so what's happening? Okay, sort of when that, that action potential is first generated and what's going to cause the increase in charge from minus 60 to plus 30 is due to voltage-gated sodium channels opening. Because if you think about the concentration gradient of sodium, 
right? There's what? A lot outside and a little bit inside. So if a voltage-gated channel is going to open, which way is sodium going to go? Inside. And what charge does sodium have? Positive, right? So a whole bunch of positive ions are flowing into that cell and causing the membrane potential to change, okay, to plus 30. Now, what then happens is voltage-gated sodium channels will close and potassium channels will open. Again, if you think about the concentration of potassium, concentration gradient of potassium, once voltage-gated channels open, potassium will leave. If you have positive ions leaving the cell, you are gonna make more of a negative charge. And so that membrane potential starts to become more negative, okay? And it'll overshoot resting a little bit because you have a whole bunch of potassium channels still open and for a given amount of time. Once then both of these voltage-gated channels, sodium potassium channels close, it will then go back to resting, okay? So again, if you look at it here, in terms of what's happening, when the membrane potential is increasing, this is due to voltage-gated sodium ch channels opening. When it's coming back down to negative, this is due to potassium channels opening, okay? And sodium channels closing, right? So they're kind of take a little bit of time for those sodium channels to close. At this point, you only have potassium channels open. Um, and so, actually, this is a little misleading. Who drew this? Um, is this our resting? So what will happen essentially is it'll actually go a little bit past resting and then come back to resting. Okay, so it's a little misleading. But bottom line is I just want you to understand when it's becoming more positive, it's because sodium channels are open. When it's becoming more negative, that memory potential is because of potassium channels being open. Okay, that's all you guys need to know at this point. Okay, so we when so this throws out a term here, depolarization. So when the membrane potential becomes more positive, we call that depolarization. Okay? And so again, you know, these action potentials will travel the length of an axon. Okay? And then once they get to the end of the axon, they will cause that action potential will trigger the release of a neurotransmitter. Okay, and so once that neurotransmitter gets released here, right? So here was your, we talked about this action potential. It's gonna travel all the way down that axon, right? So think about that, that um, neuron that's starting off in your spinal cord and the axon's traveling all the way down to your foot, to that muscle in your foot, right? Once that action potential gets to the end of that axon near the muscle in your foot, neurotransmitter gets released into this space here. And then that neurotransmitter will go and bind to a receptor, a ligand-gated channel on the muscle cell here. So we'll call this the foot muscle cell. Once it binds, it will cause these channels to open. And so if these are sodium channels, like we talked about with our action potential example, what will happen? Sodium will go in, it'll start to make that membrane more positive and can generate another action potential. Okay, so these are ligand gated channels, meaning a neurotransmitter will bind and open them. Okay, the other ones that we talked about here were voltage gated channels, um, and it's just the change in membrane potential that's triggering them to open. Okay, here it's a neurotransmitter or ligand that's binding. All right, um, <clears throat> and so it says here, so at a, at a, a muscle cell, the Right, so, or yeah, so we were saying, I was saying my example was this was a foot muscle cell, right? I don't know, whatever muscle, <laughs> okay? Um, and so the neurotransmitter that would be released in this case, or when we talk about the neuromuscular junction, right? A neurotransmitter being released from um, a nerve cell or a neuron, it's gonna be acetylcholine, okay? All right, and so it says nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, acetylcholine receptors, in muscle cells are ligand gated channels. Okay, that was my example that I gave you. When acetylcholine binds, it opens the channel and allows for sodium to go in, like I just told you, causes the membrane to depolarize and triggers an action potential, okay? All right. So it says voltage gated sodium, potassium, and calcium channels belong to a family of related proteins and that these play critical roles in signaling in all cell types. So I said that in the beginning, right? We particularly you know, pay attention to or talk most about 
nerve cells or neurons and muscle cells when we're talking about ion channels, but they play a key, key role in any cell type, okay? So an imbalance of sodium and potassium or of ions in general is going to affect all cells in your body. But again, what's going to be predominantly affected and what you what would cause the most um, sort of detrimental effects first are the effects that it would have on nerve cells and muscle cells, okay? So it says, regulated opening and closing of ion channels is a sensitive and versatile mechanism for responding to environmental stimuli. So again, think about, so the, so the sort of idea is, you know, this, these receptors that are sitting here, well, that's not only, these, these types of receptors, these ligand-gated ion channels aren't only for acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. There are many, many different types of ligand-gated channels, okay? And many different recept uh, neurotransmitters will bind to these types of receptors, okay? And then initiate a response. Um, and so there are many, many, again, many different um, neurotransmitters that will bind to receptors, but then also many different neurotransmitters that would be released in different situations, okay? And, and again, that's a topic for neurobiology. There's, there's a lot to say about this. And in fact, I think in neurobiology, I probably spend... I spend a lot of time talking about this um, and talking about different neurotransmitters, right? And what happens when those neurotransmitters bind to their receptors? What effects does that have? What are their target cells, okay? So just understand that this is way more complex than it is here. And, and I like to give the example of, um, you know, acetylcholine being released and then binding to a muscle cell because I think that's easiest to conceptualize. So just keep it there. Don't, you know, you don't need to know more than that, all right? Okay, um, so we already talked about this, right? So active transport, if we're talking about the sodium potassium pump, that's active transport, right? ATP is, is um, necessary to move things against their concentration gradient, okay? Um, so just to kind of reiterate that sodium potassium pump or talk a little bit more about it and, and understand the importance of it, uses about 25% of the ATP in animal cells. Okay, like I said, every cell has to make sure it maintains resting membrane potential. That sodium potassium pump is always working, okay? Um, so we already said this, right? But it says also, you know, these gradients that are set up by this sodium potassium pump that we talked about, right, in the, in the beginning there, are also used to drive active transport of other molecules. So if you think about cystic fibrosis, right, it's due to a defect in a chloride channel. The when chloride doesn't have doesn't move the way it should, it then affects the transport of water. Okay, and so there are lots of other effects, um, you know, because of sort of an imbalance. Like I said, so it says osmotic balance, right? So if there's an osmotic imbalance, um, that's a big issue, right? Um, okay, uh, another example of of a transporter so we just we talked about sodium potassium pump a lot um, but also glucose transporters so i don't you guys don't have to focus too much on this but i just i guess wanted to give you another example um, of sort of a, another transport mechanism we were focusing really on on the ion channels and talked about the sodium potassium pump um, but this is sort of another mechanism here. So it says glucose transporters in the apical domain of intestinal epithelial cells. So it's just showing you a particular um, side of, a, of an intestinal epithelial cell. Um, I don't know that I'm not concerned about that, but I want you to kind of just be exposed to this mechanism here. Transport two sodium and one glucose into the cell. So again, if, if the transport of sodium is off, glucose wouldn't be able to get in. Okay, so you can see how things, these ion or movement of ions are coupled to a lot of different processes. Okay, all right, so flow of sodium down its electrical chemical gradient provides the energy that drives the uptake of glucose against its concentration gradient. So this glucose transporter isn't really relying on ATP, but it's relying on the energy derived from sodium's movement to take glucose in. Okay, so again, you can kind of see how this coupling um, is super important. Another reason why, you know, if this sodium gradient is not what it's supposed to be, well, it's going to affect glucose transport as well. Okay. So this is showing you here again, glucose moving in along with these two sodiums and basically sort of, um, using the energy from the movement of the sodium to allow that glucose to get in. Okay. Um, okay. 
this is now, so this is what this is showing you. If you if you think about intestinal epithelial cells, right? So if you're thinking about what's in the actual GI tract, right? Glucose, a nutrient, obviously, that needs to get into the bloodstream. It will first move into um, the, or move into the epithelial cells this way, right? But then, then it's going to need to get transported to the blood. So on the other side of that epithelial cell, right, it says it's transferred to underlying connective tissue and to blood capillaries by facilitated diffusion. And this is actually driven by a sodium potassium pump. Okay, so, so again, um, we talked about glucose coming in. So again, this is thinking this is stuff you ate, right? It was broken down and now it's in the small intestine. We said in the small intestine, you have lots of the absorption that goes on, right? And so one of the things your body wants to take in and get into the bloodstream is glucose, right? Um, and so that gets taken in here, right? By what we just talked about, along with these two sodium ions. Now over here on this end, now it's gonna be, have to get into those capillaries, into the, to the bloodstream. And it's actually um, moves by facilitated diffusion, okay? So, which is driven by this sodium potassium pump. All right, so, um, again, you know, so facilitated diffusion, meaning that's basically, um, movement along its concentration gradient, but with the help of a carrier protein, okay? And again, um, also involves, um, it's possible or it's made possible by, um, you know, sort of using this, this sodium potassium pump or, or it's made possible by, by basically that sodium potassium pump setting up these, these gradients that, that exist, okay? All right, so we'll leave it at that. So I, I just want you guys to kind of understand this is again an example, right? Or um, example, how does glucose go in? Well, it actually is coupled with the movement of sodium ions. Um, and then on the other end, when it's moving out of the cell to get to the bloodstream, okay, it's a different mechanism, right? It's facilitated diffusion. All right. <clears throat> so it said, so again, just to kind of give names to this, right? It says uptake of glucose and sodium is an example of symport because two molecules are moving in the same direction. Facilitated diffusion of glucose is uniport because it's just one molecule, one single molecule, okay? Um, antiport, right? Two molecules can be transported in opposite directions, all right? So um, some examples here, it says calcium is exported from cells by the calcium pump and by sodium sodium calcium antiporter. So that's another example of how ions will move, right? Through, through channels essentially, or through carrier proteins. Antiport in opposite directions. Again, the, if there's any, any, um, anything off in terms of sodium gradients or potassium gradients or calcium gradients, it's going to affect this movement, okay? Sodium and hydrogen ion antiporter will transport sodium into the cell and hydrogen ions out. Okay, and so it says but preventing acidification um, by hydrogen ions producing the metabolism. Super important that those hydrogen ions get out. Otherwise, the pH will drop inside the cell and then we'll start denaturing proteins and the cells are not, cells not gonna be able to function, okay? And so again, you can see another example of movement of ions through, these, through the membrane, okay? And how important it is. So it, it's just another, um, example of, of different types of movement. Okay. All right. And that's it. So that, so like I said, the end, I was giving you different examples, um, of different transport mechanisms and transport of molecules that again, ha, ha also coincides with transport of ions, right? Um, when we talk about the movement of glucose into the cell, particularly into these intestinal, um, epithelial cells, it's going to move in along with sodium. Okay. And so we call that what? Symport, right? And then we talked about glucose moving out, essentially getting into the capillaries here, getting into the bloodstream is uniport. It's just one glucose molecule moving out by itself. But then you can also have, or you also have many examples of antiport where two molecules are transported in opposite directions. And so their movement um, is coupled with each other, okay? So again, the movement of one will affect the other. So if the movement of sodium or the concentration of sodium is, is not correct, it's gonna then affect the movement of calcium. Just like I gave you the example of chloride channels and water, right? 
um, in cystic fibrosis. If those chloride channels are defective and chloride is not able to move across the membrane, it then affects the transport of water, which leads to these thick, um, thick mu mucus that will accumulate because there's not enough water there. All right, so that ends that. And again, I mean, I think it was short, but there's a lot of information within this. And so you could see why I cut out the rest of this plasma membrane chapter. So again, this is what you're responsible for. Um, and I'm hoping everyone can, you know, if you have questions, please ask at our next class meeting. Thanks.